Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 930, October the 18th, 2019, Friday. Thank you so much for tuning in. A lot to talk about today, so let's go ahead and get to it right now. Well, we're now learning that the uh, staffer, the staffer for the bug-eyed fool, Adam Schiff, met with Bill Taylor. He, of course, was the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. We're learning that uh, Taylor met with Bill, uh, Schiff's staffer met with Bill Taylor 12 days after the so-called whistleblower filed the complaint. His trip uh, that he took to Ukraine was paid for by the Atlantic Council. We know that. We reported that a week ago. And, of course, uh, we're learning now that the Atlantic Council is funded by Burisma. And we're also, we know that Taylor is now a key witness for the Bug-Eyed Fools scam impeachment inquiry. And as I said about a week or so ago when we talked about this guy the first time, I said this guy is straight up part of the plot. Straight up part of the plot. This guy is a U.S. ambassador, which means he's been a professional diplomat for probably 15, 20 years. He's a top-line experienced diplomat. As I said before, no professional diplomat would ever, ever say what he said in that text or email where he said something to the effect of, I think it's crazy to withhold sec uh, security assistance for help with a political campaign. That's a totally loaded line. Totally loaded line. He's basically saying, yeah, that's a bad idea to withhold uh, uh, financial, uh, to withhold money from this country for security assistance unless they'll help uh, the president take down his political opponent. That's what he's saying right here. This had to be a plot. This had to be, he had to be working on be with uh, Schiff's committee. Uh, and there's all kinds of this stuff. And this is what's being leaked. People saying things in emails and texts that can later be used to be selectively leaked by Schiff to set up the president. This is a straight up plot, just like all the other plots. This is just one. There's a lot of these, and we're finding this out. I think it's crazy to withhold security assistance for help with a political campaign. You would never make a statement like that as a professional diplomat. You know exactly what you're saying when you say that. And of course, remember, the response to that from Kurt Volker is, oh, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, there is no quid pro quo here. You know, that is not true, what, what you're saying. So clearly, it was... He, he, he said it or, or wrote it in an email or a text just so it could be on the record, so it could be used by Schiff in the hearings. We seeing, we're seeing this over and over again. This is a straight up plot. Straight up plot. And somebody needs to blow the whistle on it. And I, I think that that's uh, McConnell specifically, but also Lindsey Graham as well in the Senate Judiciary Committee. You see this kind of stuff. It's very obvious what's going on here. I mean, you, this is this is obvious. This is you know you don't have to be a genius to figure out that this is a plot. These are this is all set up. This this email or text, whatever it was, by this guy Bill Taylor knew exactly. He typed that in for a reason because he knew it was going to be used later. And now he is one of uh, Taylor is now one of Schiff's star witnesses. Total setup. Total setup. And it's time for McConnell and Graham to blow the whistle on this. McConnell needs to step up and say, look, we're seeing too much of this kind of crap. It looks like a total setup. Uh, Senate, the Senate is where we have a trial. We are not going to conduct a trial in the Senate based on some, 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 some kind of a plot. So he needs to send a, a, a message loud and clear to, to the bug-eyed fool. From this point forward, we want a copy of every document from all the testimony, from all the hearings you've had up to this point and all the ones you have in the future with your little hearings. And if we don't get it, you can consider whatever you come up with dead on arrival when it comes to the Senate. We are not going to go through with a trial in the Senate based on some plot. And we know what kind of stuff is going on. We want to see everything uh, so that we can know that this is actually a legit uh, uh, inquiry and if you can't produce that or won't produce that information for us, consider your little impeachment uh, quest dead on arrival when it comes to the Senate. I will kill it as soon as it shows up on my desk. 
That's what McConnell needs to do. Quit playing around with this idiot. Elijah Cummings has, has, a, has achieved room temperature. Elijah Cummings has achieved room temperature. Well, you know, for the people of Baltimore who under the last 30 years or so that he's uh, been representing our district, they have one of the highest crime rates, uh, drugs, uh, infestations in that community. It's impoverished. It's a mess. It's a hellhole. And he's been their congressman for 30 years. He's done nothing, nothing. He did nothing for that community. Nothing. And he spent the last three years trying to impeach one of America's greatest presidents based on fraud. Prior to that, uh, he was deeply involved in the IRS uh, uh, going after um, the Tea Party group and other Republican groups. This is a lowlife son of a bitch, and I'm glad he's dead. Drag his dead monster ass up out of the swamp, chucking him up onto the uh, bank, and allow the vermin to chew at the rotting flesh. And God willing, the people in Baltimore will get a better representative and we'll get someone better in Congress. But I doubt it. He's a Democrat. He will be replaced by a Democrat. One more swamp monster pulled from the swamp. Dead. Good. <clears throat> no, I have no love for these people. Clearly. I know what you're thinking. Gee, but he died, Mike. I know, and I hate this kind of crap. You get a scumbag like this, and then he dies, and then we're all well, he was a lovely man. He was a lovely man, served the country for 30 years. He was a patriot, dedicated to the cause, served his constituents. Bullshit! Bullshit! This guy was a straight-up crook and an asshole. I'm glad he's dead. <clears throat> now, we understand now more about why Pelosi had the meltdown. Uh, of course, uh, they're in a conversation and they're talking about Syria and uh, Trump's trying to explain, of course, that there are, are you know, this group, the uh, PKK, which most of you might be familiar with, they're, of course, communist. I mean, if you look at their flag, it's actually the the hammer and sickle with their logo around it. And uh, we're talking about the, the uh, Kurdistan Workers Party. Uh, they're, they're communists. And so Trump's just, you know, probably having some fun with Pelosi. And he says, hey, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of commies over there. And, of course, hey, you guys might like that. <laughs> and that is what set her off. That's when she jumped up and started putting her finger in his face. At which point, you know, he basically called her a third-grade politician. And what uh, happened to Nancy there with the meltdown, Madam Botox, <clears throat> is that Madam Botox, <clears throat> excuse me, is not used to having uh, someone speak to her like that. She's used to people kissing her ass. Well, Trump doesn't kiss ass. He kicks ass. And so she's not used to that. That's something she is not used to having someone stand up to her or challenge her or certainly not call her out. This is not something that, you know, she's a total elitist snob, a power-mad elitist snob, and she's practically senile and nuts anyway. But, you know... I, I think Trump's just tweaking her. I, I think he probably knew what kind of a response. I think he probably knew he would get exactly that type of a response. Um, I think he's playing her. He might be trying to drive her completely nuts the rest of the way nuts so he'll finally get rid of her because she's obviously in the advanced stages of Trump derangement syndrome. And uh, that particular episode right there, you know, may have pushed her over the top. For all we know, uh, she's not long uh, from being uh, in a straitjacket in a rubber room. <laughs> and that's maybe how Trump sees it. He's like, yeah, just a few more, few more barbs, and I can push her over the edge, and we'll get rid of her. <laughs> we'll have to take her away in a straitjacket. So yeah, I think it's pretty funny, and uh, I love the way Trump uh, tweaks Pelosi, and it's, it's, it's good. I mean, like I said, she's not. That's what really set her off. She is not used to being challenged at all. She's used to, you know, everybody kissing her ass, and it just, you know, doesn't work that way with uh, Trump. So that's basically what happened there uh, with uh, Madam Botox. Uh, part three of the Veritas videos has come out, and of course, uh, you know, nothing particular new here. It's just the fact that we're, we're, we're getting it directly from a whistleblower from the inside. And isn't it funny how uh, the Commie News Network is focusing totally on this so-called uh, fake impeachment inquiry uh, from the, from the uh, bug-eyed fool, Adam Schiff? At the same time, they have an actual, real whistleblower within their own ranks, who comes forward to blow the whistle on them. They're not talking about their own whistleblower blowing the whistle on them. They're focused on the faux whistleblower and the faux uh, witch hunt uh, going on in the uh, shift hearings. 
but uh, in this most recent video, uh, you have people on the video uh, working at CNN who admit that they're on the left. Uh, they know they're on the left. They know they're left-leaning, but they simply will not admit it. Yes, I think that's obvious. Uh, you have a supervisor also uh, on this video wishing for Trump's death and even saying that the harassment of Trump is never going to end until he dies. It will not end until he dies or until CNN dies. <laughs> I think Trump may outlive CNN, to be honest with you. They're not going to be in the airports, train stations, and bus stations anymore. Oh, no, no, no. That's all going away. And, of course, you actually have one honest guy at CNN uh, who says, and he's probably going to lose his job tomorrow, unfortunately, But because you can see who he is. Um, you can see this guy clearly who he is. And he says at CNN, uh, this one of their own employees has uh, sold their souls to the devil. Yes, they have. They have sold their souls to the devil, and that poor gentleman is probably going to be out of work. Maybe he can get a job at Fox. Maybe. One American News might be better. They're more honest. <clears throat> well, we have more on the Seth Rich, uh, Ty Clevenger affair. Uh, of course, as we know, Ty Clevenger is the lawyer uh, who's working to uncover the Seth Rich uh, situation. Um, we know that he had requested documents, uh, FOIA requests through the NSA. The NSA said, hey, yeah, we got 21 pages but uh, national security, we can't, we can't release them. And they're FBI documents, basically, that, that are held within the um, uh, NSA. So, of course, that led Clevenger to do a FOIA request uh, to the FBI. And the FBI is basically saying, huh, sorry, uh, the NSA is wrong. We don't have any documents on, on uh, Seth Rich. <laughs> now, of course, Clevenger knows that's a lie because not only did the NSA tell him that there's 21 pages, but he also spoke to the uh, uh, the um, investigator, the uh, former prosecutor, who was headed up the Seth Rich case. And he says that the FBI did, in fact, 100% take Seth Rich's digital devices. They definitely took his devices. They definitely investigated those devices. They definitely looked into those devices. Therefore, there should be documents, and the NSA is saying yes. So the prosecutor says the FBI has Seth Rich documents. The NSA says uh, there are 21 pages of Seth Rich documents, but now the FBI is saying, huh, the NSA must is wrong. We don't have any. So now uh, Clevenger is going back to the judge, and he's going to try to work it out. Uh, I don't know. I don't know where this case is being tried, uh, who the judge is, or whatever. Uh, generally, you don't have a lot of success and these types of things, we can only hope for the best. Maybe Mr. Durham will look into Seth Rich. Do you think he actually went, he said he's going to look into the origins. Do you think that Mr. Durham uh, has um, gotten into anything involving the Seth Rich, the hack of the DNC, CrowdStrike, or any of that? I don't know if he's going down that road or not. He certainly had to pass that road. Whether or not he chose to go down it or not, I don't know. I don't know if that's kind of out of his purview or whatever. But it's going to be interesting to know if we ever get the final report from Durham and Barr, uh, if anything's ever been done with uh, Seth Rich. Uh, I don't have a lot of optimism that uh, Ty Clevenger is going to get anything out of the FBI here. Uh, you know, it's it just you don't generally have a lot of success in, in these particular types of situations. I hope he succeeds, but I, I would not be uh, confident of that. But I admire him for trying. I certainly do. We're hearing that Boris has a deal. Yes, Boris has a deal. I don't know what's in the deal, but uh, just early reports are that it's very similar to the Theresa May deal, which got shot down in Parliament three times, and which is very, very unpopular. Apparently, it's got a lot of the things that the Theresa May deal had in it, but it's got some extra things that deal with the Northern Ireland situation. Um, and I guess what worries me most about it is the photo that I saw in the article shows Boris Johnson over at the EU with all the technocrats. And the technocrats, are, along with Boris Johnson, are smiling ear to ear. They're back slapping each other. I mean, Macron has got a smile from ear to ear. Um, if all these EU technocrats are that thrilled about whatever this deal is they just signed, I know I'm going to hate it. <laughs> I'm sure Nigel Farage is going to hate it. But, of course, we had the Queen come out and make that statement uh, about a week ago saying that, you know, she wants the Brexit, uh, just as they like they voted for. 
so I'm wondering, there's one of two things maybe going on here. Either that was the queen, and there's probably other people in the UK deep state working from behind the scenes, putting pressure, applying pressure. Uh, either that was the queen giving a message, fall in line, and sign the deal. Maybe that was the message she was sending, in which case Boris comes back, the parliament signs the deal, and that, that's the Brexit deal you get, and it sucks. Or it's Boris Johnson playing a game. He goes over to the, U, to the EU. He gets a deal that he knows that they'll sign on to, that Northern Ireland will, will agree to, or not. And then he comes back to the UK, puts it up to the parliament. They vote it down. He says, oh, well, I tried. I had a deal. I had a deal with Europeans. I come back here. It gets shot down. Screw it. October 31st, hard Brexit. So it's one of these two things, probably. I would bet on the former because, um, you know, it's the deep state. <laughs> and I don't think that they roll over and play dead at the 11th hour. So, unfortunately, that's not what you want to hear. Uh, if you're in the UK, it's not what you want to hear if you support Brexit like I do. Uh, and I'm sorry to be a pessimist, but, you know, I'm just looking at what's been going on and I find it hard to believe that after all this fight has been put up for all this time, three years, that they're suddenly going to roll over at the 11th hour and just let it happen, let hard Brexit occur. Um, so I don't know, maybe Boris Johnson has outsmarted everybody here, I don't know, but I don't think we're going to know anything until we see what this deal is and until we see what the parliament does with it. And then of course, if it fails, we'll have to see where Boris Johnson goes. Uh, you know, maybe the deal will fail and Boris will say, okay, that's it. Uh, I, I got a deal. Parliament shot it down. The 31st is here. It's hard Brexit. See you later. And I'll be ecstatic. I'll be very happy. I'll be celebrating right along with all of you. But consider me a skeptic at this point. Very interesting. Trump was having a press conference in, uh, in the Oval Office um, with a foreign guest. I forget who it was, but someone pretty important. Oh, Italy. I think it's Italy. Somebody from Italy. And um, so Trump starts talking about all the corruption and he's talking about the IG report coming out soon. It's going to point out all this corruption that occurred. He's talking about the 2016 election, all this corruption that occurred. And and a couple times during that those comments, he says, he says, you know what, you know, we're going to find out about this person and that person and what they were involved in. And he says, and hey, maybe Obama was even involved. Let's see. Let's see when all when the when the uh, when the investigations are done, if President Obama is involved. And I'm, so I'm just kind of watching that and I'm watching Trump, the way he behaves. And I mean, the way he gets up every day and he's so positive and he's constantly going after it. And, uh. You know, he's under so much attack, you, you got to wonder how in the world can a guy be under so much attack? They're trying to impeach him. They're coming in from every angle. It appears that everyone around him is some sort of a spy that's been put in place to take him down. Yet he, he manages to act as if, you know, he calls it out, but he doesn't seem to be concerned. And if it were me, I'd be a nervous wreck. I, I'd be a mess. I, I wouldn't be able to focus on doing my job because I'd be so you know, caught up in everything that was being done to me. But somehow Trump's able to just blow it off, dust it off, and go on and do a great job. And it leads me to believe that he knows something. And the way that he was wording this when he was talking today, and he said, yeah, you know, all that corruption happened in 2016, and with this guy and that guy and this guy, and he's talking about it, and he's like, you know, and I'm waiting for the uh, IG report to come out, and then there's another investigation that's being looked into, this stuff's all being looked into, and it's all going to come out. It, makes, it leads me to believe <clears throat> that Trump knows something. It's almost like he's got this inner confidence that he knows how this thing is going to turn out and it's going to turn out good for him. That's the way it seems. And so it means he probably knows something we don't know. And I'm sure he knows a lot of things we don't know. But it gives me a certain amount of uh, you know comfort uh, to see that he can, can have this sort of demeanor in the face of all that's coming down on him and it leads me to believe that he, he may uh, know something or else he's the, the, the most, um, he's the toughest son of a bitch I've ever seen in my life if he's just totally winging it and doesn't know what's coming, if it's just the future is a big question mark and he's handling it the way he is, man oh man, he's, he would be something else. But I think it's more likely that the reason that he can carry out his, and do his job every day and 
continue to push, continue to do such a great job and maintain his attitude and be so positive and energetic is because I think he does know that there is a serious reckoning coming and a lot of things are going to come out and it's going to vindicate him and that he's going to win big. That That's just a gut feeling I get when, when I'm watching him and listening to him. And I don't know if you many of you feel the same or if it's just me, but uh, that's just kind of what I'm picking up. Trump, of course, is in Dallas at this very moment as I'm speaking to you. He's at a rally which may be his biggest rally yet. Uh, there was a video yesterday, literally a day and a half, two days before the rally, of long lines two days before the rally. Uh, so this may be his biggest rally yet, and you can be bet that he's on fire. <laughs> he just gets better and better. But uh, one thing we should note here is it has been reported that a man has been arrested at the Dallas rally, and apparently this guy has... Uh, had uh, a helmet, a bulletproof vest, a backpack, a breathing mask, an aerosol can, and a gun. He is now in police custody. We don't know anything more about him other than that. <clears throat> we have crazy Madame Botox <clears throat> having a little presser of her own a couple hours ago, actually, uh, just before I was putting my notes together for this video. And she actually says that the voters are not going to decide on impeachment. It's not going to be the voters who decide on impeachment. <laughs> you think not? Hmm, Madam Botox is delusional. I would like to remind Madam Botox of one thing. You don't think that the voters are going to decide the impeachment? Yeah, voters do decide impeachments. They absolutely do. You do not impeach a president, impeach a president uh, who you got to have the support of the American people for impeachment. If you don't have, you can't impeach a president without the American people, the majority, at least at least 50% being for it. They don't have those kind of numbers. I'm sure of it. But let me remind Madam Botox of one thing. Madam Botox represents about 60,000, 60 to 65,000 people in a voting district in San Francisco. That's who she represents. About 60 to 65,000 voters, left-wing liberal nutcase voters in San Francisco. President Trump represents 63 million people all across the country. 63 million people across the country. She represents about 60, 65,000 voters in a district in San Francisco, which is a mess which is a freaking mess. She needs to keep that in mind when she makes a statement like that because I can assure you, Madam Botox, the people do decide the votes on impeachment. Try to impeach a popular president and see what happens to you. Why are the big money donors holding back on quid pro quo Joe? Why are the big money donors sitting on the sidelines and not giving that money, some money, to quid pro quo Joe? Just to even keep him going. His campaign is bleeding. He's running out of money. He's spending money at twice the rate he's taking it in. Soon he won't have any money and he'll have to discontinue his campaign. Now he's supposed to be the establishment centrist candidate. And the people who are... Uh, in fact, he, he's not even really in first place anymore. He's now fallen behind uh, Warren, if you believe the polling that's coming out in the, in, the, in the early primary states. And Bernie, apparently, he's in a nip and tuck with him, almost dead even. Now, we know that these big uh, donors, these are big corporate business people. These are big banks. Uh, these are not people who want a Warren or Bernie Sanders plan. I can assure you of that. They are not interested in having their capital gains go up. Trump cut their capital gains. Uh, they're not interested in seeing them go back up 15%. They're not interested in seeing a 95% tax. They're not in interested in seeing a lot of the things that these two socialists are pushing. And we know they don't back them because we just had a report about two weeks ago, Wall Street telling the Democratic Party, if you nominate Warren, ain't no money coming your way. Now, these people are sitting back on the sidelines and they planned on spending well over a billion dollars. They spent $1.3 billion. In 2016, certainly they're planning on spending at least 1.5, maybe 2 billion to defeat Trump in 2020. Yet here is their guy 
bleeding red ink, desperately needing money, and they're not coming up with any. They're sitting on it, sitting on the sidelines, watching Biden go down, knowing good and well that the only two likely people high enough in the polls uh, uh, to, to get the nomination right now is Bernie and Warren, which they can't possibly want any part of. So what the hell's going on? Well, clearly, they don't have any confidence in Biden. That's pretty obvious. That's pretty obvious. But if they don't have any confidence in Biden, even if they don't, they should still try to at least get him enough money that he can beat Warren and Sanders. And even if they lose the general election, at least they don't get Warren and Sanders to become the new heads of the party. There's something going on here. There is something going on here. You don't have that much big money sitting on the sidelines watching supposedly the guy that represents their folks, the establishment, going down in flames with two socialists hot on his heels, who would be the likely people who would win the nomination, either Bernie or, or, or Warren, or probably both. She'd probably be the, the, the nominee, and he, he, she'd choose him as her, as her vice. Warren Bernie ticket. You think the big money in the Democratic Party, the big corporations, big banks, are, 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 are just sitting on the sidelines watching Biden go down so that they can get uh, two socialists? <laughs> I don't think so. There's something going on here. There is something going on here. And even if they let things go as they are, and even if they tried to fund Biden, and this may be, have something to do with it, they can see that he clearly, no matter how much money they throw at him, they might be able to keep him in the race, but he's probably, and they might even be able to keep him top three, but you're probably going to end up with a brokered convention. And if you do end up in a brokered convention, you're going to lose. Brokered conventions rip your party apart because they create a situation where you, you create divisiveness. You have an inner party fight right there at the convention. It happens live on TV for five days. All the candidates have to go at each other really hard. They try to cut deals, they do backstabbing, and you don't know what you're going to get in a brokered convention other than you're going to lose in the general election. You come out of a brokered convention so divided that you can't possibly beat uh, your opponent in the general. Everybody knows this. That's why you don't hardly ever see a brokered convention. That's why the Democrats created their system. That's why the Republicans created their system, to make sure they never have one. They don't let it happen. But if the, if, the, if the situation continues as it looks right now, you're either going to end up with a Biden or a Warren, or you're going to end up in a brokered convention. And you may end up in a brokered convention anyway. There's something going on. You do not have this type of big money sitting back watching their guy go down with two socialists on his heels, and they're just going to let it happen. No way. No way. Uh-uh. Something is going on. There's a plot. There's a plot at play. Because the Democrats are full of plots, are they not? Everything these people do is some sort of a sinister, diabolical plot. I mean, this is what these people do. They're horribly, horribly corrupt. There's something going on. No way that kind of money is sitting on the sidelines watching Biden go down with two socialists on his heels. There's something going on. Okay, I have an idea what's going on. Many of you probably as well. I'll let it go with that because I'm running out of time. The Washington Times. For those of you who stuck through 30 minutes of this video, you'll be very happy. You'll be very happy because the last couple minutes of this video, you're going to learn something that you probably are very interested in. Thanks to the Washington Times. Washington Times is reporting that it was John Durham, John Durham, who got Mifsud's phones. It was John Durham who got Mifsud's phones. And Sidney Powell has told the New York Times that the way that she found out that John Durham got Mifsud's phones is that someone told her, a source, who she's not going to name, obviously. Durham runs a very, very tight investigation. 
<clears throat> we don't see hardly any leaks, if at all. This may be the first leak, if this is a leak, coming from him that I have seen. Maybe he leaked it out to her to help. I don't know. Maybe someone on his investigative team leaked it out. Maybe someone on his investigative team said something to someone else in the DOJ uh, who's favorable to Trump or Sidney Powell or Michael Flynn or someone like that. Someone, someone, some white hat, obviously, leaked that information to Sidney Powell so that she could go to court. And they didn't just give her, hey, Durham's got the phones. Someone gave her the model number of the phone, all the information, the SIM card, identification number of the SIM card, the whole nine yards. And now Durham's got it. He's got these two Blackberries. Can you imagine what is on those Blackberries? Can you imagine the people who Misfit talks to based on what we know about him? Do you think he talked to the rotten Reverend Clinton or anyone at the DNC? Christopher Steele? Halper? Downer? Australian? Italian? Ukrainian? Uh, British intelligence? The CIA? The FBI? Can you imagine what Durham is learning from what he's getting off those SIM cards from those two Blackberries? And you got to think about something else. You you can say absolutely 100% for sure now that Mifsud absolutely was not working for the Russians. Because if he was working for the Russians, <laughs> DOJ wouldn't have these phones. In fact, if Mifsud was working for the Russians, he would be dead right now. And he may be dead right now. I don't know. I mean, they may have already taken him out. I don't know. Uh, that's very possible. I would not bet against it at all. And it wouldn't be the Russians I'm talking about. And then you have to ask the question, did Uncle Bob the Executioner know about these phones? Do you think there might be a conversation on there with Andrew Wiseass? Man, oh man, wouldn't you love to see the metadata, the data and the, the data and the metadata on those two blackberries that Joseph Mifsud was using. Because the Washington Times story, according to Sidney Powell, is saying that the phones were being used by Mifsud. Her source told her that the phones that Durham got were being was being used by Mifsud. Was being used by Mifsud. Not owned by Mifsud, being used by Mifsud. Well, I'll let you guys uh, kick that one around in your head for a couple of hours. What do you think about that? My oh my. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll be back tomorrow with more Towergate. See ya. Bye.